In this podcast, chat about the win against Norwich, the defeat to Stoke, we'll head to Exeter and go to Shouts Island. Say what? Support. Curtis Fleming is there on the edge of the air. Fleming for That's Craig it. Hignett. Hit it, Higgy. Higgy hits the track. Oh! Abanelli coming alive again. Janino wants the ball played to him. Abanelli spots out. Hello and welcome to the Borough Breakdown podcast with Johnny, Dana and Matt. Uh, we are the Borough podcast that gives you all of your Borough match day chatter in a podcast. And Borough's seven win game streak is now officially over um, due to a 2-0 defeat against Stoke uh, at the Riverside yesterday. Borough now currently sitting 10th in the championship table, three points off the playoff places. Um, guys, as always, I'll one key takeout uh, to describe our week. Um, Matt, since you are joining us once again, um, I don't think you've actually joined this podcast when we've actually won a game, so um, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but um, what was your one key takeout uh, from the week? Yeah, well, this is the first win I've had, actually. So um, it's good, but Borough couldn't make it too. They had to bring us back down to earth with a bit of a bump. And I guess that's kind of my key takeaway a little bit, like, Never get too high, never get too low. Um, I think the win streak was always going to come to an end. It's a shame it come to an end in the nature it did at home to Stoke City, who all just always seem to just enter a purple patch when they come to the Riverside for some reason. But yeah, I think it's just to take the positives out of the seven game win streak, but not get too hooked on the defeat from yesterday. I think it's just a case of learning from it, taking it on the chin and... I think it's more so how we react to it and how we bounce back from it and just not let what happened yesterday turn into a slump or a run of defeats or anything like that. So I think it's very much like what Carrick reiterates quite often in his interviews and stuff. Take the positives out of the winning run. Take the, not negatives, but where we can improve from yesterday and just ensure it doesn't it doesn't snowball into anything too bad and we can get back on the winning streak hopefully sooner rather than later. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just one one defeat in what eight games isn't isn't too too bad. Um, but Dana, uh, what's your your key takeout from the week? My key takeout is a question. Actually, was it the hmm. most obvious outcome in football that Stoke were going to halt our winning run yesterday? Because. <laughs> Possibly. I was thinking it on yeah, I was thinking it on Tuesday night. As soon as the Norwich game finished, I looked at the calendar and saw that Stoke City were up next, and I could not shirk the feeling that we were going to lose to them. Obviously, them coming into the game off the back of successive victories, albeit at home, their away form. I was looking at the stats actually, only three teams had accumulated fewer points than Stoke City on the road this season, Rotherham, Sheffield Wednesday, and Plymouth. So I was kind of gaining a little bit of a picture of they're coming into what Matt said, they're a purple patch. They're probably going to beat us. So basically, the moral of the story is, if you want something, don't play Stoke City. And also my my other key takeout, sorry to have two key takeouts, is that I feel like Bora need a rest. <laughs> we've got yeah. a, a game against, sorry, we've got the Plymouth game and we don't have a Tuesday game after that. It goes straight to Leicester the, the following Saturday. So I feel like that would be good for Bora just to recuperate but we do have a tough two fixtures, Exeter and Plymouth, coming up. So it's going to be interesting to see how we perform in those because it does look like Borough getting a little bit leggy. Yeah, and look, it was a, a difficult day. So I think it was definitely an off day, a uh, frustrating one, uh, if that is well. I think the only highlight was seeing you, Matt. Obviously, we sit next to each other, don't we? So it's uh, that was a highlight for me. We were in OCL chips and gravy as well. But I think the I think the key takeout was uh, was that's football, isn't it? I think obviously the title of our podcast this week as well. And uh, you know, you're going to win a lot of games um, with this team. And you know, we've we've seen the best of Borough over the last couple of weeks. We've also seen probably the worst of us. Um, and I think when you look at our you know our wins, draws, and defeats, you go that is the most te- most tenth place side I think I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, but I think we could be so much better in in those moments. But I think overall yesterday, out there was too many players having off days. And I've also thought Stoke played quite well and, and deserved the win in every single way. I think we'll obviously we'll break the game down shortly, but we'll let's 
go to the probably the highlight of the week. Um, of, obviously, it was beating Norwich, uh, Sam Greenwood and Sammy Silvera, um, of all players, uh, seeing the win uh, at Carroll Road. I thought it was actually going to be a 2 0 win, and then they scored a lovely, lovely goal towards the end. Um, but Matt, what was your overall assessment of the performance against Norwich? Because it was a big, big win for us, right? Yeah, it was a really big win. It's quite weird. My assessment's kind of improved more so since the game. I think during the game, I thought we looked quite well balanced. We looked in control. We looked quite composed. And I always look at Carroll Road as a really tough place to go. So to sort of see Borough just play as well as we did it was really good to see. And I think more so second half when we were 1 0 up. I think naturally, I was watching it and I was I was just I think it's because they had so much possession. I was getting a bit anxious and I wanted to like shake the TVs to stay like Borough, like stop giving them so much possession. I felt like we weren't keeping the ball for any prolonged periods. And I thought they were, we were kind of inviting Norwich onto us a little bit, but then post-match when I listened to Carrick's interview, I found it really interesting that he spoke of the fact we were sort of happy to sit back and we were happy to let them have the ball and we were comfortable. And I've just never really, like looked at this Borough side in that way. The fact that we had the confidence to just let them have the ball, we were confident in our structure and our defence that we were just happy to sit back on our lead, catch them when we could on the counter maybe. And it was just nice to see that we had that element of control. So it was it was a nice, well-balanced performance and I was really happy to see Sammy Silvera get his goal. I was absolutely delighted for him. I thought it was an absolutely wonderful finish as well. And it was probably nothing less than what we deserved. I, yeah, they got a screamer at the end and it was a bit gutting that Senny didn't get his clean sheet. But I think it was a really good performance. We showed so many different sides to our game. Um, and it's definitely, I think, uh, uh, well, it should have been a platform to obviously keep building from. But as a performance in its own, I think it was one of our most complete performances of the season. Yeah, and, and then obviously it was a very tight first half as well. You know, Borough would... We're, we're in control for most moments. You kind of see what we were trying to do. But in the second half, you know, we scored very, very early um, with Greenwoods and a bit of shit house, but we'll come to that a little bit later on. Um, <laughs> but do you think we were quite fortunate to to get that goal? Because was there a little foul in, in, in play just before we were scored? Oh, 100%. 100%. John's on Janulis. I was really surprised that Janulis and the other Norwich players didn't appeal for that both before the goal and immediately after it I guess it was symbolic of a team that have pretty much waved the white flag under David Wagner I I wouldn't be surprised if he's sacked pretty soon but yeah it was 100% a foul listen we'll take it but it'll probably come back to bite us at some point because the good old footballing gods like to level things out don't they so I'm sure that we'll get a few decisions contentious decisions against us as we probably already have this season Sunderland fans will say the whole Dan Neal thing but it was one hundred percent a foul. Yeah, it, it well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't well, it doesn't matter. Then I think you know you you're, you're going to have these moments, and that we'll come back to buy us. But I think it was really good of us to get that goal when we did, because I think it helped us completely control that second half, and I think it knocked the stuff in out of of Norwich, and it didn't. And for me, I, I don't think we. We were dominant in that first half, but I think sometimes when we say that about game state and how things can potentially change, and you know when we did get that goal, it had a bit more confidence, and there was a little brief moment in that second half when Norris just started to get on top, and then, but of all things, you know, instead of playing up from the back, we hit the ball long. Rogers heads it down, it plays it through to to Sam, uh, not Sam Green, but Sammy Silvera. Too many Sams in this team, and <laughs> he goes on and scores his first uh, league goal for Borough, which I felt was a huge moment for him. And Matt, you mentioned it a little bit earlier on, um, as well around it was a it was a big moment. But what do you think that could do for him now? Because you can see when when a striker or an attacking player gets that first goal, and the tent just have a bit more confidence, but. What do you think it was for him when the ball in the back of the net? You could see the relief on him, but how big of a moment was it for him? It was massive. I think um, I think he's he's been a little unfortunate. I think things could have been a lot different for Sammy Silvera this season. If you go back to the earlier games, he obviously missed that ridiculous sitter against Coventry, which if that goes in, it's one each. He might have got the goal that helped us get a point from that game on another day. And then obviously he also missed a really big chance against Huddersfield, which would have won us the game. So, you know, he could have played a huge part in both of them results. And I think since then, maybe Carrick continuing to persist with him in the early parts of the season, I think maybe did, 
have a worse effect on him because I feel like he was maybe then trying too hard and he was trying to do too much and affect games too much. And the more he was trying, the more things weren't coming off, the more he was sort of getting fans on his back a bit and his confidence was just getting lower and lower. So the fact that I think Carrick rightfully took him out of the team and started bringing him in as more of an impact player has gave him the opportunity to, to have a moment like this. And it was a really, really good finish as well. It was just like perfectly drilled into the far corner. Keeper had absolutely no chance. He didn't even move. And I, I loved the the reaction afterwards, like the, the players when he celebrated, they were all around him, they all looked delighted for him. And there was also a, a post-match image of Carrick and Silvera. And Carrick, I think I think as well, during the goal, I think we saw Carrick's celebration as well. He he could see how much and how big of a moment that was for Sam Silvera. And there was a really good thought of them together after the game as well. So I think everyone around the club was the players, Carrick, they were all delighted for him. And... He's hoping that it might it might start a, a good run of form for him and and maybe like yesterday if we have a day where we've got a couple of players off it as I Jones for example wasn't very good yesterday having a player like Silvera who, who can come on who's full of confidence I think that's that's a good option to have I think having a confident Sammy Silvera coming on and impacting the game is better than maybe the Sammy Silvera we had at the start of the season so it'll only board well for Borough's squad depth and especially when Brent win a run like we are over Christmas and stuff, having him in form might be really, really important. The 12th different goal scorer for Borough in the league this season. At that point, only Swansea and Cardiff had more different goal scorers. Now it's Cardiff, Leicester and Swansea. But yeah, 12 different goal scorers this season in the league, sharing the the goal responsibility. I would still like to see Borough have that main man up front that's getting that Big, you know, the lion's share of goals. But it, it is good that going back to the whole narrative of like squad depth, what Matt said there, we've got players that are stepping up and chipping in. Yeah, and I want to come to like the, the changes that we've had this year as well, then like, you know, obviously when the end of the season happened last year, we pretty much lost 66 goals um, overnight with, you know, with Giles, Archer, Ramsey and Akpom all, all leaving the club. And there's always a bit of doubt in your mind, especially when you have that recruitment. The, the recruitment is well coming in. How would you replace those goals? You obviously, you, you try to do it in different areas, and we've spoken about that previously. But how do I think? Do you think results like Tuesday, given like how well Norwich started the the the, the, the season and also the teams in and around them as well, and we're getting results with them? Does it show that we can still compete at the top end of the table as well? Like even with all the changes that we've had. I think we can compete for the playoffs. I think there's a few holes that need plugging in our squad, a striker, another striker, for example, that will probably push us that extra level. But I, I feel like it's kind of irrelevant, uh, Norwich's start, because they have been poor of late. But it showed a different side of Borough. It showed that we can really dig deep defensively. And we were put under a lot of pressure by Norwich. And I was going to put this in the Telegram chat, but I didn't want to jinx anything. Their final ball was terrible. Passing, shooting, crossing, up until Jonathan Rowe's goal, which I was actually really disappointed we conceded because when you're on a run, when you're on a, a clean sheet streak, difficult to say, then you want to keep that up. So I was a bit annoyed that we conceded that. But yeah, I've lost my point. This is typical me. Um, yeah, it, it shows a different side of Borough that we can dig deep and we can be really good defensively when we're put under pressure. And I think we defended incredibly well. Even the goal that we conceded, I don't think it was anything poor defensively, but it shows the side that we can be solid defensively. And we haven't really seen that be the narrative under Michael Carrick. So I was really glad to see that, to be honest. Yeah, and obviously that win as well, seeing uh, Bora go up to seventh in the championship table uh, on on Tuesday night. Uh, and Matt, like Bora went from the bottom of the league to seventh in the space of a month. Uh, <laughs> so I, it was great. It's great for us on this podcast as well, because obviously, you know, it's all doom and gloom one moment and then you just turn out seven wins the next. But um, how would you describe Bora's turnaround? Because it's nothing short of impressive, right? Yeah, it's been amazing and I'm delighted for Carrick. Uh, it's it's quite interesting really because we look back at the, the the early start of the season and it's quite... It's really nice to see that what Carrick was saying and, and it's proved true. You know, he, he kept saying, he, he kept coming out and I think it was even on the podcast I was on previously, actually, we were talking about a quote that he come out and said where he said, you know, he was saying, I keep seeing good things in training. I'm seeing 
good things. I'm seeing promising things. And of course, at the time, it was really hard for fans to see that um, when the results were as bad as they were. But the data was backing up the fact that Borough were performing really well. We were creating chances. And it is a case that these things normally level out. So it was good to see that he's proved right. It, it shows he is a very good coach. It shows that he knows what he sees. And he's not just, you know, just coming out with absolute nonsense like managers have done in the past to try and keep fans on side or maybe throw players under the bus. Like we can trust Carrick with his process. We can trust him in his words. And it was just nice to see that all the hard work and the new signings have come in and made a good impact and everything that I, I feel like we were working hard towards that maybe wasn't quite coming off at the start of the season. We were starting to see that bear fruit a little bit. So I was really happy for the team. I was really happy for Carrick. And I think it was also just a real relief because it was tough at the start of the season. It felt remin very reminiscent of last season. So maybe we shouldn't be surprised to see that we've just absolutely shot off the table as well. <laughs> but I also think it should come with a slight, a slight air of, of not, not complacency, but I think we should just also be wary that as quickly as we can maybe fire up the table, it's very, very tight and we could quite easily slip back down it again if we have a bad run of results. So it's great that we've gotten up to this point. I think it's even more important that we build on it and like I said at the start we don't sort of let the last six or seven wins mean nothing and we slip back into a poor run of form so it's I'd like to look at it as a platform we can build on heading into the Christmas period but it puts us right in the mix and I would never have thought that Borough would even be in the playoff mix before Christmas like earlier in the season so to see us in the mix before the end of October it just gives you that excitement and confidence that we are possibly going to do something special this season which is hopefully playoffs. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, I think the for me the the turnaround just kind of emphasizes what the championship is, isn't it? It's just silly. It's just a really silly league, and any run that you can can have, you can shoot up the table, you can shoot down it. And we've seen it last year. QPR were a prime example. They were second, I think, um, in the bottom November time, and they end up nearly getting relegated. And look where they are now in, in the division. It looks like Neil Warnock's going to take over there uh, as well. Shock. You know, the, the, of I know, course, shock horror. Just wheel of Neil Warnock out every time. Yeah. There's a problem at a football club. Yeah. He, he returns. You know, obviously, he doesn't have Abdel Ab Ab at this uh, this time around. Um, but it's uh, it's going to be interesting if it, if he does take that job and how they do it. But in terms of Bora, it's a really good turnaround, and I think we've been really impressed with all the last few games, and it shows that we can really compete and we've got quality in the side. In, in the side, but we do have a lot of injuries. How will they like catch up to us? Will or not? And we'll come to that a little bit later on. But I think the the win yesterday and the win streak has what we've done has and what we've done hasn't been short of shit housery um because we've been <laughs> we've seen some shit house moments across uh the last seven games and in the game against Norwich there was a bit of shit housery uh once again so on that note let's go to shit house island let me take you to a place where memberships are smiling face pushing shoulders with the stars where strangers take you by the hand and welcome you to Wonderland from beneath the Panama. Shit house island drinks are free, fun and sunshine. There's enough for everyone. All oh, that's missing is the sea. But don't worry, you're a shit house. Uh, I really, really need to apologise to all of the Wham fans out there. Um, you know, I, I'm sorry I keep I keep like ruining Wham fear to be honest. But um, Dana, there was Shithousery who enters uh, the Shithouse Island this week. Yeah, it is Sam Greenwood. We seem to really, really like doing this. But at Carra Road, there's a particular corner, and if you uh, eagle eyed on our shit house island you'll know that Hayden Hackney and Ryan Giles were inducted to the island last season because they shushed that particular corner at Carroll Road <laughs> well Sam Greenwood did it too and I don't know if there's some context here that we're missing Leeds did play Norwich the game before obviously Sam Greenwood is a Leeds player on loan with us so I don't know whether there's something there that maybe 
Norwich fans were giving it the big end to his Leeds teammates. I don't know, but Sam Greenwood is on Shithouse Island and there was a, a lovely moment as well from the Norwich fans, which I just want to play. Listen to this. Unbelievable. <laughs> Oh. We're already quiet. <laughs> it was brilliant. Like he's oh. shushed, like, I mean, to be fair, he's not wrong, is he? And that is brilliant reaction from that Norwich <laughs> fan. Um, I love the like calls of sacked in the morning as well that are just going on. There's a lot going on there sonically, but yeah, very good. I don't know what the context is, but we do like shushing the Norwich fans. I don't know what that corner has done to us, but um, it's it seems to be shit house island HQ Carroll Road, and I'm not mad at it. Mm. Yeah, meanwhile, there's a hotel there already. It's on the ground, so you know, it's like, and it's, it's cheap, you know, cheap facilities. Um, obviously, the drinks are probably not free there, but you know, on the island, they're, they're as free as you want it to be. Um, but it's fantastic shit housery from Sam Greenwood. You know, I absolutely just love out like that. Um, but yeah, well, congratulations to Sam. You know, I mean, we we can't really send you a coconut or anything in the post, but I mean, just congrats, <laughs> I guess. Um, <laughs> I congrats, but I think like. Um, Shit House Island was was very much uh, short lived, I'm afraid. Um, as Stoke uh, came to the Riverside uh, and beat us to you no know, goals from Michael Rose and Medri Leris. Um, sealed Stoke's first win uh, on T side since 1997. Um, so you know, I in there earlier, really Jenna, with Stoke were always going to win that game. Probably that was the reason why. Um, but let's have a let's have a look at this game then because you know obviously two 0 defeat the streak's over now then but what was your overall overall uh, assessment from the game I know you said a little bit earlier on about too many off days as well so let's hear what what were your thoughts on it it was just spookily reminiscent to Borough's early season performances where our passing was abysmal the weight of the balls into players that are five yards away was so off we were overplaying a lot of them we couldn't get anything going because of that funnily enough I watched the extended highlights just before we came onto this podcast and it's basically just a compilation of Borough losing the ball even when we attack we lose the ball (laughs) we just get a lucky ricochet off one of the Stoke players yeah I mean to be fair to Stoke I will give them credit because I think they deserve it Borough scored in each of their last eight games coming into this one scored 12 in our last five the fact that they've kept a clean sheet with Jack Bonham in goal, who a lot of sort of fans are saying is a League Two standard goalkeeper. I think they deserve credit for that. They kept it solid and Borough had no answer to that. There was a point in that first half where Sam Greenwood had the ball on the left-hand side, approaching a crossing position. And I'm looking at the Borough players trying to get into the 18-yard box. No one is. Josh Corbin's the furthest player forward and he's jogging. And that reminded me of Coventry away when Don Goodman pointed it out on Sky Sports commentary that there's just no Borough player busting a gut to get into the box. That was really disappointing. Our threat was minimal, really. I was looking at the stats and we had four shots in the second half. Because Our possession was increased. We had 59% in that second 45. Four shots, which were fewer one fewer than the five that we had in the first half. And it amounted to an XG of 0.44, which is like half a goal. It's like now. And I think because of Jack Bonham in goal, I, I really wanted Borough to test Stoke a lot more than they did. And they just didn't. It was very passive. It was slow. And we had, we just had no threat. And it was weird because we have had threat recently, just in that game, as you mentioned, Johnny, too many off days and collectively it it made for a really, really poor quality game. Borough just didn't play smart in that match at all. Stoke boxed us in, they managed the game in the second half and we had no answer to it. Yeah, and, and on that as well, you know, I think there was... Uh, there, there was only a few moments in the game where I thought we, we were hoping to try and get something. In. It was when we changed it really um, and brought on all our little dribbly boys. And in terms of Morgan Rogers and Sil- Silvera, and you know, we, I think it kind of opened that weakness up. And I thought these Stoke players, they don't like players running at, running at them. And we were playing it from side to side. If it, it felt like we were kind of playing into their shape and trying to make things really difficult for us. There was a moment in the first half where Jones got past his man really quickly, create an opportunity, and we didn't really maximise 
for that. And I think when Rogers came on, like Laf came on, and we're willing to run at the Stoke defence, that could have potentially unlocked something if we had more time. Uh, but we didn't really do that. And I thought it was a really poor and an off day yesterday. But Matt um, O'Carrick said, um, you know, he, in his press conference at the end, uh, he said it was one of those days. Um, and that's that, that's football, I guess. Uh, but why, why <laughs> do you think that was then? Why, why do you think it was one of those days of Bora? I think it's a mix of too many players being below the required level. Um, it was an interesting conversation on tees yesterday, which I agree with. I think Mado might have mentioned it, that if you if you have two or three players performing, you might be able to make the substitutions or you might be able to have the players around to, to get you through and you can get away with it. But <clears throat> when when you've got the majority, I mean, I, I can maybe, I can't even think of maybe one or two or even three players that were at the required level yesterday. I think that's always going to make things tough. But it was also... I think a bit of a tired and laboured performance from Borough. I feel like the intensity wasn't quite there. The passing was off. It was weird. I think 10 of the, the 11 started against Norwich and they just looked like they'd not played together before or at least in the last few weeks. They were just not on the same wavelength whatsoever. The passes looked tired. As you say, you made a good point there about the when we were in attacking areas, getting into the box no one was there. We weren't attacking the ball. I think there were a couple of times where we'd whiz a ball across the, the, the box. I think I remember there was two or three, but there was no one really there to capitalise. So I think Borough deserve credit that we've managed to get through the last few games with the level of injuries that we've had. But inevitably, I think it will catch up with you at some point. And I think maybe we were looking a little bit leggy, a little bit tired in that performance yesterday. And, and as, on top of that, Stoke obviously defended really well and I think they do deserve credit but at the same time they just had to do what was necessary to beat Borough yesterday. I think the, the the timing of their goals was really important as well. Scoring early stopped us gaining any momentum. I, I can't recall even like a five or ten minute period in the game where we had like sustained pressure. You look to like the Birmingham game, we were knocking on the door all game and we finally got our rewards whereas yesterday I can't even think of a sustained period where we really had Stoke under pressure. So, yeah, we were just, we were like a car that was like starting and we were going into like first and second gear and we'd stall and break down again. And it just felt like we were just going to go through that cycle over and over. And if we'd have still been playing now, we still probably wouldn't have scored. So it it was just one of them days. That, that is the, the way to sum up. Yeah. Is there any concern at all in your mind, Dan, around so many players having so many off days at once? Um, I don't think concerned is the word. Obviously, within an isolated game, it wasn't great, was it, to see how many players. I think Crooks was the only one that was on on song. Going into the Exeter game, if the levels are very similar, then I think I'd be worried because it would probably have this overarching thought attached to it that Borough are very tired and need a rest because I took from that game all of those sloppy passes all of those misplaced ones very leggy type of performances and actions within a game and not concerned for that game specifically but let's see how we play against Exeter if it's very similar then I think it is cause for concern a little bit just Quickly, why do you think we are a bit leggy, Dana? Because like we've only just came back from an international break, so you know we've we've had we've had time to relax and maybe work on something on the training ground. You know, I only had a couple of games uh, since, so why do you think we we do look a little bit leggy? I don't know. To be honest, the point is and will be made about injuries, and mm. they will catch up eventually. I kind of see it that well, we've had injuries for the entirety of this run. It wasn't ever a problem then. Now it we've lost and it is. It's a very strange one. Maybe it's mental fatigue. I don't know. There's been you you can't get away from it. There has been injuries, there's been illness. It could play a part, but I don't know. Maybe it's just a one game thing. Maybe we just went into that game and we were all prepared and it just didn't work. Sometimes that happens in football. Sometimes it's not something to really look into too in depth. But 
I don't know. I, I guess we'll probably have more of a thought and an opinion on that if it continues into like the next few games. So fingers crossed it doesn't. If we freshen up against Exeter, then we can probably nail the Stoke game as a bit of an anomaly and a one-off. But we have to make sure that it is a one-off because if this becomes a bad run, as Matt said earlier in the show, we could very easily sink down the table because it is that tight in that seeded batch in the championship so yeah very um peculiar but we'll probably find it more interesting to think about as the games progress mm. and obviously there was a player missing yesterday in here and hackney and obviously there's, there's naturally that assumption that if a big player is missing for that one game then he is the you know that he, if he was playing yesterday, we would have won. If the, the kind of comments were, were flying about, but Tom, do you think not Tom, Matt? Sorry, it's so <laughs> easy to do it. You know, did, did this before. Uh, I take it as a compliment, honestly. I really do. I, it's it's so natural for me to just say Tom and Matt and ah uh, God, just, you know, he's living it up now. I have seen him. You know, he's on, on his little holiday, and I was just like, wow, like you've completely changed drinking red wine and all sorts honestly just that boy <laughs> just changed tom i know you're listening you've changed um <laughs> anyway sorry Hayden hackney uh big miss uh matt i need to call you tom again there uh <laughs> i'm gonna see obviously he wasn't playing yesterday and obviously we know the qualities that he brings here in hackney but how much of a miss do you think he was yesterday um he was he was a miss in midfield i think it would be silly to say he wasn't because I think I think although Barlasa looked all right in spells, I think Housen especially had a really, really bad game. So I think if you're looking at midfield in isolation, yes. But the game as a whole, the Borough team as a whole, I don't think you can say that just because Hayden Hackney was missing, that was the be-all and end-all for why Borough lost yesterday. There was a lot more to why Borough weren't at the races. As you say, going forward, we weren't as direct. We didn't attack the box as much as we did, as, as we have done in the final third. I think the goals we've con- we conceded as well, um, really poor defensively. I, I don't think Hackney would have prevented either of them goals possibly being conceded, especially the, the, the first one. So, yeah, it's easy. It's always easy to say, yeah, he's a big miss. And he's always going to be a miss, but I don't think you can blame him or well, not blame him. I don't think you can blame the fact he was injured for Borough losing yesterday. So he is a miss, and I, I, I can't wait for him to be back in the side. But there was more to why Borough lost yesterday than Hayden Hackney being suspended. Yeah, and I'll I'll come to that second goal in just a moment. Um, but Dan, I just want to get your thoughts on Hayden Hackney, Hackney being a miss, and then obviously we've got these injuries now as well. I think there's there's five players that are out now. We've obviously Ryan McGree, Tommy Smith, Daryl Enahan. Uh, Marcus Force again, and and obviously Lewis O'Brien as well. All longer term injuries. Um, obviously, do you think they'll catch up to Borough as well? Um, you know, obviously it's a squad game, of course, the championship. But um, one, how much would miss was Hackney yesterday? Then two, uh, do you think the injury list that we're, we're starting to slowly accumulate is could potentially become a problem in the in the next few weeks? Yeah, I've seen a lot about Hackney and we missed him and this, that and the other. And of course, we're going to miss him because Hayden Hackney is one of our best players. So if you take one of your best players out of your team, then you're going to feel that absence. But his absence wasn't the reason why Borough lost yesterday. And I'd even go as far as saying if he was in the team, Borough still would have performed poorly and we still would have lost that game because collectively they were off. Apart from Crooks, who had a good performance, they were all very below the standard that they've set in recent weeks. And Hackney wouldn't have changed that. Of course, he's a fantastic player. He's fabulous to watch. He's got a wonderful career ahead of him. But it's too easy to say that, or to basically create this narrative that he was the reason we, or he, him not being there was the reason we lost that game. Because I just don't think that rings true, to be honest. Like, Hayden Hackney's absence isn't the reason why Dale Fry couldn't complete a five yard pass. <laughs> His absence isn't the reason why Josh Corbin was busting a gut to get into the box when Sam Greenwood had it on the left hand side. It's, it's obvious that he's a miss, but I just don't think that he was. His absence was the reason we lost that game. We lost that game because collectively we're off. We conceded two poor goals. As Matt said, Hayden Hagley being on that pitch would not have eliminated the goals that we that we conceded. And I don't think it would have brought Borough back to a performance level where we were good enough to win that game. 
Yeah, it was definitely a performance which you want to forget very, very quickly. Um, but I want to have a look at the the second goal from from Stoke yesterday because it was a, a really interesting uh, match and obviously tactic, uh, tactical battle from Stoke yesterday. Obviously, they were really trying to be expansive when they got the ball and try and break with pace, but also the two v ones that they were trying to to make um, on on both wings really and try to really nullify Boris' uh, width play. And obviously, it kind of starts really. And um, when we look at it, you know, Millers, we've got a 5v5 um, in on the, well, Engels, Engels left, Stokes, right? Um, and do you think that Borough are pretty much containing uh, Stoke at this point? But I just want to talk about Thompson because he's, he's just gets, he gets the ball and he's able just to play it right through. Um, it's a lovely little touch. It takes uh, Greenwood, it takes Crooks, and it takes Isaiah Jones completely out the game. And Jones is anticipating um, Thompson to maybe open out and take the ball back past the centre half and the start again. But he doesn't, he brings the ball forward. And Jones is obviously on the back foot at this point because on that left hand side, there's so much space um, for, for Stevens uh, and said to, to get forward and, you know, have that 2v1 uh, against Vandenberg. And I, I like to look at Stoke at this point because you see both wing backs, wing backs on both sides and the wing as well really try to bust the gut to get forward which we didn't really have on in for Middlesbrough yesterday um, but as Borough tried to like recuperate like that shape and the goal right okay let's maybe try and nullify this now we'll get more like narrow try and fall and stop the Stoke getting into our box Green was just, just jogging back you know um, and he's he's sensing uh Leris going forwards and you, you can see him just checking him and checking him and checking him but he's not he's just jogging he's just jogging and they do get that ball on the left hand side or it should really have an 8v5 um and it isn't really a dangerous position to be in where Bora are and what you do what you do want is Greenwood to really try and line up with with Barlasa with Housen with Jones and also Engel's got uh Johnson to look after as well and McNair's after uh, Dwight Gale, who is, I can't believe he's still alive and he still exi- exists, but he is. Um, but then obviously when he's jogging back and he, he's still checking him, he's still checking him, but he hasn't looked. Um, and then by the time the ball comes to Johnson, it's already too late because um, that 2v1 against Engel is already there. And then they go on to to score and Middlesbrough, you know, are two, two goals down. But when you look at the goal, again, like, it really does start from that play through from Thompson, how he opens his body up and gets that ball on that left-hand side. And then you see the wingers on both sides really get forward and Greenwood, Greenwood stops and stops and stops. And then it's already too late. And then it's already in the back of the net and Stoke go on to, to score again. So, I mean, he was in Shadow Island uh, a moment ago, Sam Greenwood, and now he's in the shit defending club um, for <laughs> not getting back um, too much. But I can't really blame him too much. with a lot of off days yesterday, but got to be a little bit better in those moments but let's move on now um to podcast questions ah yes podcast questions each week you get the chance to send us a question via twitter at bore underscore breakdown uh email the board breakdown hotmail.com or by joining our telegram chat with over 350 bore fans chatting everything but borough and um, there's so much that goes on that com- uh that chat it's great and also it will absolutely hammer your phone if you have the notifications on um but the first <laughs> question uh this week it's from nick and it was on twitter and he says is our squad currently good enough uh, for promotion? Um, Matt, I'll come to you. Um, is our squad currently good enough for promotion? Um, via the playoffs, potentially. I don't think it's good enough to do anything regarding the top two. I know it's easy to say that at the minute because we've got the two arguably the two greatest, maybe even statistically the two greatest um, championship sides at this point in the season ever, <clears throat> which is a little bit of an anomaly in the fact that that's happened in the same season. So I think even if we had a squad good enough to compete for the top two, Leicester and Ipswich might already be have such a head start. You know, the points per game we'd have to accumulate to catch them and the drop-off we'd need from the pair of them, I think is so significant. I think top two is a little bit out of the realms of possibility, even if we had the squad to do it. So I think it's playoffs for me. And I think that would be a success. I think given, as you say, the goals we've lost, the players we've lost, the fact that we've had to bring in all these new new signings, bed them in, and we've started sharing the goals around. I think playoffs would be 
a realistic target and one we can achieve. I think getting through them playoffs when you've got Leeds, maybe Southampton and who else might ever, you know, might be in there as well. It will be a challenge. And I think compare it to the playoff four we were in last season, it's probably more likely going to be a tougher playoff four this season if we get in there. But who knows, Borough might might be better fared as, as an underdog in the playoff four. So I think I think I think the squad's good enough to get in the playoffs and then it is just a lottery able to see the form we're in at the time all the other sort of variables that happen when you get to that stage of the season. So I'd say playoffs, potentially top two, I think it's probably gone. Okay, then, uh, well, yeah, Ipswich and, and Leicester can't stop winning uh, at the <laughs> moment. Um, but if we were to win something, um, Rob Flynn asks us, uh, would you rather win the League Cup or get promoted? Uh, I'll ask you both this question, but then I'll come to you first. Would you rather win the League Cup or get promoted? Oh, this one's easy. I'd rather get promoted. No, I'm just kidding. I'd rather win the League Cup. I've seen Borough get promoted and it was fantastic. I loved it. But to see Borough win mm-hmm. the League Cup, I know that some fans have had the luxury of enjoying that euphoria. I haven't because I was four. I didn't like football back then. So, yeah, the League Cup, it would be incomparable, I think. It'd just be amazing, I think. So, yeah, the League Cup, 100%. Yeah, well, I've seen both. I was there. At, I was there in Cardiff. Um, yeah. We won the cup, um, and I've seen us get promoted. Uh, so, uh, well, you know, I'm stuck for choices. For so I'm, stuck, I'm stuck for choices. You know, um, thanks for that, Matt. Um, I'm the but, same. Mate. I'm in the same boat as you. I was there for both as well. Don't worry. Yeah, so, um, but what <laughs> I do, feel what left you out. Uh, well, don't be an afterthought, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Matt. Jeez. Um, sorry, Dan. That was harsh. I'm sorry. Um, okay. but Matt, what would you go for? League Cup or promotion? I'd go League Cup every day of the week. I think every year we've got a chance of getting promoted. Not every year would we have a chance of, of potentially winning the League Cup. As you say, I, my earliest memory actually was us winning the League Cup. I don't remember anything before that League Cup final, but I remember it like it was yesterday, and that's the earliest memory. Um, so yeah. That would be it for me. And plus, I'd find the adventure of Borough being in the championship, but also then being in Europe quite intriguing because obviously we win the League Cup, we'll get into Europe. So I'd be very intrigued to see Borough's schedule the following season, playing like Friday, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, (laughs) Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. I think it would just be an intriguing journey to go on, playing in about five different competitions at once. So yeah, League Cup all the way. Okay then, yeah. And obviously... Everything's aligning this year. You know, Middlesbrough had a very, very bad start. It was the worst start this year uh, since 2003, 2004, the year that we won the League Cup. Just saying, just saying, it could happen. Um, but I think I would, I think I would, t- I would love t- uh, to see us win the League Cup, but I would try just to avoid the Premier League at the moment because it's absolute mm. shark tank. Um, you can see with the bottom three this year or bottom four that how, how badly they're struggling. And they're not bad, bad teams, but, you know, struggling. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it just shows how much money is in the Premier League now, how much they're going to track good players, really good managers in the division as well. And, you know, it, it takes a lot for you to to stay up and have a really good foundation across the group, uh, across, the, across the league and the club. So, yeah, we'll see. I think Boris are on that journey, but I'd take the League Cup right now. Uh, but let's move on. Um, is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's the present place. Yes, the praise and place, uh, the only place I'd like to give praise to a player, coach and staff member, um, Matt's parrot, and also Dana's um, lovely shirts and no egg sandwiches with her today. <laughs> um, so, praise and place, guys, who gets your place in the praise and place this week? Uh, Dana, I'll let you go first. Who's in your praise and place? I'm going to put Matt Crooks in there for his performance yesterday. Crooks is playing really, really well at the moment and is deservedly getting credit for that. And I think even despite Borough's poor display collectively yesterday, it's still worth praising the one player that was actually somewhat decent. And then I also want to praise Morgan Rogers because he came on and he showed what I really want to see from Rogers, that drive, that ball carrying ability. He won a couple of fouls from those positions where he was taking the ball from deep and accelerating and advancing up the pitch. Um, and he linked up quite well. He had that chance where uh, 
drew, drew a save out of Jack Bonham, which is more than what most of the Borough players could muster in that game. And I think he was bright off the bench. So Morgan Rogers is in there and Matt Crooks is also in there in the praise of place this week. Congratulations, uh, guys. Um, Matt, who's in your praise and place this week? I think it's hard to disagree with the tree. Um, he was the only the only player who could say come out with credit in both games. So, yeah, I think he's got to be in there. I think other than Crooks, I just love Senny Dieng so much. I think I'm going to have to start up the Senny Dieng fan club, honestly. I just love that guy so much. He's slowly becoming like my favourite Borough player and he's he, he is really, I think, showing himself to be one of the best goalkeepers in the league. I think, I think we've had QPR's pants down, to be honest with you. And I still laugh going back to the tweets at the start of the season when we got Dieng and they were like laughing at us saying we've got a terrible goalkeeper and all this. And I think Dieng has been absolutely amazing. And if it wasn't for the first goal that we conceded yesterday, which he probably could have done better with, he would have probably been in there as well. But I just want to just put my love out there for Senny. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I think Sammy Silvera as well, just because... I was. I'm just really delighted for him that he he was able to get his goal, and I think given what he, what he's been through this season, I think the way he took that goal was was really impressive as well. So I'll give him a shout out too. Yeah, I'll put uh, Sammy Silvera in mine as well. I think he, you know, I was very very happy for him to to for to see him score. I think when I was seeing those misses earlier in the season after a really good preseason as well, I just thought, oh no, why? Um, but a lot of players, you know, they are starting to come good. Um, and also, I want to give a shout out to my boy Lucas Engel as well. You know, he's he's playing really well at the moment. Had a bit of an off day, a bit. I think collectively everyone had a bit of an off day yesterday, but I thought he was okay. Um, yesterday probably wasn't really helped by agreeing with too much uh, on that left hand side. But I think he's he's slowly winning a lot of fans over again. Uh, Engel after a start, really, which I think is really unfair. Like how everyone was, you know, slaying after like maybe what one half of football I think against uh, Wednesday which I know fair enough a lot of people you know were coming for us uh, for on that one but um, I think he deserves a bit of praise for his turnaround and what his performances have been and also Sam Greenwood as well and shout out to Crooks as well just for being a, a tree um, but let's uh, move <laughs> on is low. Uh, <laughs> yeah you know well we need trees to breathe Dana so it's um, yeah, he's, 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 he's there you know fair play to Matt Crooks to, is my to, oxygen to, tank yeah. He's the reason that I live. <laughs> if you like, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, guess. Um, I guess, yeah. Oh, well, this, this, this podcast got deep really quick. Um, let's, uh, <laughs> let's move on. Um, it's trivia time now. It's part of the show that I like to call trivia um, because we talk about trivia for 30 it's seconds. It's quite self-explanatory, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah it says, exactly what it says on the tin, you know. Don't give much away on this podcast, do I? Um, but... The question uh, this week, it could be a difficult one uh, for you guys as well, um, is can you name five players and a manager who are linked between Middlesbrough and Exeter? Um, you have 30 seconds. Okay, this is a bit of disclaimer as well. It is recent names seconds. only. Oh, um, is recent names only. I might just give you a bit extra time because I can. Um, um, <laughs> but there is there is some players that probably back there, the five names that you've might find or you might have but um oh, yeah I, I felt a bit bad i felt a bit bad for you because some players were like 1930s and i was like unless you know you're a time traveler you're probably not going to be <laughs> remember that one um but anyway your 30 seconds starts now making sure that doesn't repeat like it did last week but it didn't <laughs> fantastic news um so guys this, this is a bit of a difficult one uh for you this week five names and a manager um who are linked between middlesbrough and exeter um obviously it's the first professional game that we've had against them which means actually something in terms of club competition or in the league as well so we haven't really been uh with them too much um but can you name the five players manager um matt 
I'll let actually I'll let you work together this week on this one. But Matt, um, can I'll let you go first? Have you got any answers um, which might help? There's two that I'm pretty confident on. I think one is the most obvious, and I think I think George Friend. I don't know if mm-hmm. he played for Exeter or he he was in their youth academy. Um, I also recall, and this is just because I looked at Exeter's team when when obviously in preparation for the pod. I think Yannick Wiltshut plays for them. Ah, mm-hmm. yes. Um, and the Last only other one, the past. The only other one, um, and this is that. This is my mate. I'll, my mate Aaron. I'll give a shout out to. We we were at a Stockton Town game not too long ago, and I'm sure there was a there was a player who played for the opposition who used to play for Borough, and when I Wikipedia'd him, I'm sure he played for Exeter. And it was Jonathan Grounds. Okay. And that's all um, I've got. The other two I've just completely guessed. Okay, so who are you two? Who are you, who are you two guess? But congratulations, you have got three out of the five there. So congratulations oh. on that one. With friend uh Walsh and uh Jonathan Grounds. Um but yeah, go on. Who are you who are you over two? Uh, I've just dropped Neil Warnock in there because there's a, there's a probably a, a good problem. He's, yeah. he's managed and played for most clubs, and he lives down that end, doesn't he? That end of the country, so I've chucked him in there. And I, I don't know if, on his slow and painful drift down the leagues, Adam Clayton maybe he's played for Exeter. I, I don't know. Slow and painful drift down the yeah. leagues. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like I've seen him in a red and white kit, but I could be completely. Uh, you thinking Doncaster? Ah, uh, it might be Doncaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That might but you be are, it. unfortunately, you are incorrect on those um, oh. those names. Unfortunately, not Warnock, um, really. Oh well. Yes, I know. I know he has managed um, ninety out of the ninety-two clubs, but the other two left um, are uh, Exeter and I don't know, <laughs> Bournemouth or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, he'll manage that. He'll manage Bournemouth. Yeah, hundred percent. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Um, there'll be an AI version of him at some point. You know, get AI version of Neil Warnock to manage it for the next few months to get over relegation. <laughs> anyway, sorry. The the remaining names, Denimal. Uh, who are you going for? I just had one, and it was George Friend. But I hope I get an extra point for the love heart that I've absolutely nailed there. That's a very star in art. And yeah, a little no. arrow through it. But yeah, he only got George Friend, which, yeah, he came through. I'm pretty sure he came through the academy there. Um, yeah. One of their own, I think. So yeah, George Friend's the only answer I've got, unfortunately. But fortunately, because I think it's correct. Well, it is correct. Yeah, well, yeah, you are correct on that one. But um, unfortunately, the love heart does not get you an extra point uh, Damn this it. week. Um, but the remaining names, oh. if you if if you didn't get them, and you maybe or maybe there's people shouting at me uh, in the car or at home watching us. And Sam Stubbs, Elliot Venice's favourite player, oh. um, apparently <laughs> yeah. um, plays uh, for, uh, or did play for them as well. Um, now this one's a different one, different one, but John Gittins as well was the the final name. And then the manager who was connected between us both, and he hasn't managed him just yet, but he played and was brought up in that in, in the neck of the woods, was Gary Monk. Um, so he, of course, uh, played for Exeter. And, did he? Uh, yeah. He did, yes. Um, and obviously he's through that youth system as well. Um, but unfortunately, go on. Can uh, I flag something up? Yep. And this is pedantic. Sam Stubbs didn't play for Borough, right? He was he at did. Borough. He didn't he, play a game. He did play um, for Borough at points in um, in preseason, so I will take that. Um, <laughs> oh, shit, I was so, get Johnny in the island. So, unfortunately... Preseason. Jamie Patterson played for us in preseason. Does that count, too, for a yeah. future question? Yeah, definitely. Um, Dana's just not happy you didn't give her a point for a love heart. That's all it is. She's just furious. Grow up, Dana. (laughs) Um, For that. uh, There's no need for that. that. Uh, Anyway, uh, what there is need for is Exeter away on Tuesday uh, night where we obviously go to face the team that uh, took out Luton. in the the previous round, and how are they, and how do they play? Well, they do set up in a in a three four one two. They, they use pretty much their defensive base um, as their 
probably their strengths, really, if you look at a fat mob. Um, three players who are in the top three, um, <laughs> all three are defenders, um, you know, <laughs> uh, Dimitri Mitchell and Alex Hartridge as well, um, all at the highest, and the two of them are centre halves, and one of them is a left wing back, um, of course. Um, and I'll say defensive base is probably the, the reason why they are where they are, just because they can't really score at the moment. Uh, they're currently 20, 21st uh, for goals per match at 0.8, and this is 16th uh, for goals against. They do have the fifth most, fifth most possession in League One right now, 56% on the average. And in that 3 4 1 2 ship, they really try and get the ball out wide quite quickly and try to break teams down through the channels. And I think that's where Millsroom might find a little bit of problems coming into that game. But, you know, when you've got that 1v1 on your wingers, I think Millsworth will have some more of uh, occupying that space in the middle. It would be a really, really difficult game for us. And I think if they if we stop their combination players and we stop them getting balls in the box, I think we're could potentially get some. But it could be a really, really difficult game for us. Um, on Tuesday, obviously, they did beat Luton. It was no fluke. Um, and Luton were in a bit of bad form and they haven't really picked up since. Um, but, guys, I want to do your predictions uh, as well. Um but how we feel about this game? Can Borough go um, one step further in the League Cup? Um, Matt, what's your prediction uh, for the game uh, on Tuesday? Um, I'm, I'm fairly confident. I think it's a great chance for us to um, maybe rest a few tied players. And it's a great time to have a game, I think, straight off the back of the defeat we've had. So I think we'll get the reaction that we need. And I think like, the was it Bradford? I think it'll be a 2-0 a solid 2-0 win. I think earlier in the season, I recall they started quite well, but I think given their form at the moment, I know they'll be right up for it and everything, but I think it'll be like a, a similar Bradford. And, and to be fair, I know he's injured. I was going to say McGree will probably set up Rodgers again, but that's not going to happen, sadly. So never mind. 2-0. Yeah. Um, well, well, with that as well, they, they've uh, the lost the last five part from the weekend where they were able to stop the rotten one one draw against Lincoln, and um, so obviously it's a big big uh, point for them. But of course they did start the, the same. I'm full of confidence, but haven't won the game since, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but then obviously Borough haven't been to the quarterfinals since the 2018-19 season where they got beat against Burton Albion one um, nil at the Riverside oh, un oh, under under bad. Tony Pulis. Um, we didn't actually have a and a fun fact for that night, we didn't have a shot on target, which is very peerless. <laughs> yeah, very peerless. Very um, on brand. Against Burton. Uh, yes, Burton Albion. Jesus. Um, look, I don't write the rules, you know. I don't write history, but we did get beat. Um, at home. Uh, two of them, 1-0. Uh, but then, uh, what's your predictions and thoughts on the game against uh, Exeter? Uh, I think we will win, but I think it's going to be tougher than it might suggest initially, mostly because I think we'll make it harder for ourselves. I'm just looking at up to analysts now, actually. And in terms of XG against in open play, Exeter are ranked pretty well, 10.35 XG. Um, so that's the fifth best in League One. However, they are underperforming that because they've conceded 15 goals from open play. So there's maybe a little bit of an issue there for them um, defensively or maybe in certain moments in games. And they are the worst team in the league in terms of the form in the last six games. Just the one point picked up, two goals scored and 12 conceded. So it's a banana skin, I feel like. But I think Borough will get the job done. I'm going to say a 2-0. I'm going to go with Matt. 2-0, Borough. Two, two nils. Um, and Dan obviously said they're the worst team in the league right now. Um, for four, uh -oh. I didn't, I purposely didn't say that because of the mock curse. Well, um, you know, curse. Uh, the official, bringing it official back. Curse. Yes, the official <laughs> curse of Middlesbrough <laughs> Football Club. Um, joining us again. Um, I, to be honest, guys, I, I, can, I can see uh, Exeter scoring. Um, I can, unfortunately, uh, but I do think Bora will will just just have enough. I'm going to go with a 2-1 Borough win and hopefully in the last eight and you never know um, what happens then. But guys, thank you very much um, for joining me as always. And to listeners and the viewers, thank you very much for watching us, listening to us. Don't forget to give us a five-star rating on your podcast provider, a thumbs up on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and all that kind of fun stuff. But for right now, Middlesbrough gets stalked by Stoke um, and the seven-win streak is over. That's football. Up the board breakdown. <laughs>